Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Worship This Week. I am John Strickland, the worship pastor at Tabernacle Baptist Church in New Bern, North Carolina. And this podcast exists to equip and prepare worshipers at Tabernacle. Well, this week we are continuing to talk about that uh, idea of preparing for worship. Um, last week we talked a lot about why worship is essential, uh, why corporate worship specifically is essential for the life of the church, the life of the believer. Um, and now we're going to talk about why you should prepare for worship. It's kind of for, uh, given that I prepare for worship. I'm the worship leader. Uh, my team prepares for worship as they rehearse and get ready to play the songs and lead uh, the music. Uh, the pastor prepares for worship as he uh, prepares a sermon and prepares prayers. Uh, but why should you prepare? Uh, should you prepare? Why should you come ready uh, to worship? And is there, is there any reason uh, biblically why uh, you need to come mindful ahead of time about what you're going to be doing when you come to church. Uh, and I think there's some good reasons. I'm going to give us three uh, good reasons about why we should prepare uh, for worship each week as we gather together. Uh, the first one is simply that worship is a response to God that's prompted by the Spirit, not the worship leader or the pastor. Let me say that again. Worship is a response to God that is prompted by the Holy Spirit not prompted by the worship leader or the pastor. Uh, it can be easy for us to think of uh, coming into a gathering and coming into the worship service and and looking to the leaders of that gathering and then taking cues from them and, and responding to them. And in a sense, that's true. Uh, in a sense, we're there to lead and to facilitate uh, the worship that happens. Uh, but biblically speaking, uh, when you worship God, you're not responding to me, you're responding to God. You're not responding to Pastor Scott, you're responding to the Lord. Um, a good biblical framework and paradigm for understanding uh, a good biblical theology of worship uh, comes from a theologian and author named David Peterson, who wrote a book called Engaging with God. Uh, and that title is the, sen- the essence of what his, uh, what his definition is, his definition of worship biblically, as he, he went through the whole Bible and said, what, uh, what does each part of the Bible theologically say about worship? And his conclusion was uh, that worship in the Bible is an engagement with God on his terms and in the way that he makes possible. And so uh, worship is an engagement, a, a, an interaction, a dialogue with God uh, that he initiates. And so God reveals himself to us and we respond. And that's a, a, a common um, theme uh, that I want you to start understanding about how you think about worship is the, that, that rhythm of revelation and response. God reveals himself first and then we respond. That's the rhythm of worship. Um, and, and so in that dialogue, uh, between God and us, um, God is the one who reveals himself to us at the moment of conversion. That's when worshiping starts. Uh, when we're saved and we hear the gospel, uh, we respond to that uh, in obedience and faith. And then from then on, um, our life is marked by uh, continuing to seek God in the Bible as he reveals himself to us uh, in, in fresh ways by the Spirit. And then we respond back to him in how we live our lives and becoming more like Christ. Uh, and so corporate worship models that, uh, and, and it represents that reality. Uh, so we hear from God, and then we respond to him. Um, and so uh, since uh, worship is uh, a response to God that's prompted by the Spirit, um, worship uh, is not contained only in uh, the time that we gather on Sunday morning. Um, worship is, uh, corporate worship is an expression of worship. The worship gathering is an expression of worship, but that's not the totality of what worship is biblically. Um, and a key uh, text to illustrate this is Romans 12, 1 and 2, where it says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And he's not talking about singing songs. He's not talking about gathering together and hearing a sermon in that passage. He's talking about how we live our lives, being obedient to Christ, holy and acceptable, uh, and that he calls that worship. And so uh, as believers, uh, worship begins uh, at the moment of conversion, but it begins before we start that Sunday morning service time, and then it's going to continue after that. And so worship is not just contained to an hour on Sunday. Worship is the whole life of the believer, and it's, it's going on before we gather, and it'll continue going on for us after we leave. Um, and so being prepared for worship, uh, for the first thing, it simply means that we're coming in already worshiping. We're coming in as worshipers, living a life of worship, and that corporate gathering then is just an overflow. It's just a, a weekly expression that we do together that represents the worship that we already have going on as we live our lives every day 
uh, in obedience and faith as believers uh, and and as uh, as children of God saved by Jesus Christ. And so preparing for worship uh, can take a lot of forms. Um, and so uh, just in that spiritual sense, there can be some ways that we can be spiritually prepared uh, as we come into worship and then some practical things that we can do. Uh, and so we'll talk about those uh, in future weeks about how to prepare. Uh, but why should we prepare? The first reason is just because worship uh, is a response to God that's always happening. Uh, it doesn't start at the beginning of the service and, and I don't start it. Pastor Scott doesn't start it. The Holy Spirit starts it. God starts it. Um, and so we should be prepared because we're already worshiping when we come in the doors of the church. Number two, uh, worship, worship is something that we give and not something that we primarily take. We should think of worship as something we give and not something that we take. Hebrews uh, 13, 15 says, Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. And I want to key in on, on two words uh, in that verse. And the first one is continually, as we just mentioned. Uh, worship is something that's continually happening. Um, if we thought of worship as only what happens in an hour on Sunday, and it would not fit the definition of continually. Um, and, uh, and in this in this verse, the author of Hebrews is talking about the sacrifice of praise to God, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name, uh, doesn't just happen once a week uh, when we gather. It's continually happening in the life of the believer. Um, and so uh, worship is continually happening. And then the second thing I want to key in on that verse is the sacrifice, the word sacrifice. So worship is a sacrifice of praise to God. And we saw that same word in Romans Chapter 12, uh, that worship is a living sacrifice. Um, uh, the idea of a sacrifice is something that we have to give up, something that we have to offer. Um, and, and the idea that, um, that a lot of us seem to have in our culture today, uh, that we have a kind of very consumer-minded um, uh, idea of what worship is, that we come to church uh, to partake of whatever the church has to offer us. And so they have music that I like, or they have music that I don't like, or they have a program that I like for my kids, or they don't have a program that I like for my kids. And I'm going to come and shop around just like I shop for consumer goods and choose a church based on the things that I can get out of it uh, and not and not think about worship on the basis of what am I giving into this, to this uh, experience, into this time. Um, but the Bible doesn't give us any uh, hint that worship is a, is a consumer mentality. Um, uh, it, the Bible doesn't uh, give us any sense that worship is like going to a ball game or going to a concert or going to a show. Uh, in those settings, you can go without being prepared for anything. You can just show up and sit down and be a passive consumer. You can watch and enjoy the game. Uh, you can listen to the concert. You don't have to have any prior knowledge or experience or anything to just go and sit and be a passive observer, a passive consumer. Uh, but in worship, we should be active participants. We should be active participants. Uh, a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name, presenting our bodies as living sacrifices. Nothing about those phrases is passive. Nothing about those phrases is taking as consumers things that we can get for ourselves. It's all about giving up of ourselves. Um, and, and, and the blessing in that uh, is, is that uh, unlike Old Testament sacrifices where uh, where they had to offer sacrifices of blood and they had to actually lose things of value uh, and sacrifice them. Uh, so rather than sell their livestock or eat it uh, for the value that it had intrinsically, they sacrificed it and killed it and burned it. Um, we don't have to do that. Uh, we have to put into it, but we also get out of it what we put into it. Uh, that's just a phrase that I've always heard in musical ensembles in school and different band directors would say that all the time. You get out of it what you put into it. Um, you get out of your instrument what you put into it. You're not going to enjoy playing your instrument if you don't spend time practicing. Um, you're not going to enjoy uh, being in the, in the band if you don't uh, spend time practicing to be uh, a better musician. And so you're going to get out of it what you put into it. If you put more work in, you're going to get more enjoyment of that out. Uh, in worship, it's very similar. If you put the effort in and you make the sacrifice and you put the time in to be an active participant rather than a passive consumer, um, then you're going to reap the spiritual rewards of that. You're going to reap the spiritual benefit of participating in worship and engaging with the music and 
the preaching and the scripture, um, and you're going to get out of that spiritual growth and maturity uh, and encouragement from the Holy Spirit. Um, and so worship is not something that we take from only. It's primarily something that we give. And then in that, in that giving, in the sacrificing, uh, in, the, in the effort, uh, we then are, uh, we receive from the Lord the blessing uh, uh, that he intends for us to, to get from being in worship. Um, so worship is a response to God. Uh, it's, it's prompted by the Spirit, not the, not the people on the stage. Worship is something that we give, not something that we take. And then number three, uh, worship, uh, preparing for worship helps us orient our attitudes toward God uh, and others before ourselves. Uh, preparing for worship helps us orient our attitudes toward God and others before ourselves. And so, uh, yes, there are benefits that we are going to receive from the Lord by preparing for worship. Um, but I would even commend you further to, to prepare for worship uh, because of how it will honor God and serve others even before yourself. Um, and, and even then, that's how you're going to reap the, the greatest spiritual benefit, I think, uh, when you're thinking about yourself last. Um, uh, but when we view our role in worship as that of participating actively in order to honor God and to serve others, and then we hold ourselves accountable uh, to that responsibility, it helps us move our attitude and our thinking away from focusing on ourselves. Um, we honor God because he is the object of the worship. So we're coming there to adore the Lord and to praise him and to thank him uh, and to acknowledge him, the fruit of lips that acknowledges his name. Uh, we're coming there to honor him. And so when we prepare and when we come ready to be a, uh, an active participant in the time of corporate worship, we're honoring God uh, because we're showing uh, uh, even more so why he is valuable. He's valuable enough uh, not just for us to come and sit and watch and listen and, and, and observe, but he's, he's valuable enough to us to honor him by being coming and being prepared to participate actively. Um, number two, we honor the leaders and the pastors of the church by positioning ourselves to get the most out of what they've prepared. Um, so we as leaders and, and Pastor Scott as, the, as a preacher, we prepare in order to serve you, in order to feed you and to, to create a, a worship experience, to facilitate a time of corporate worship um, that you would benefit from, that you would grow from. Uh, and so when you come prepared to participate in that and you're ready to receive that, um, you honor us uh, and you honor the other leaders by positioning yourself uh, to get the most out of what they have prepared. Um, and, and then finally, uh, you know, we think about the vertical and the horizontal in worship, the vertical meaning our relationship with God, horizontal meaning our relationship to others. And those things are related. Uh, and so uh, and so they're related here. Uh, if if preparing helps us honor God with our relationship vertically by by honoring him uh, as valuable and worthy uh, of our preparation of coming ready to worship and be participating actively, um, then we honor our brothers and sisters in the same way. Uh, because participating actively uh, by singing and reading the scriptures and being an example of actively listening to the sermon, all those things help other people do the same. And so when we come and we are ready to participate and we are focused uh, and we are en engaged and enthusiastic about what's happening in the service, other people will see us and we will be an example. And, and as a mutually encouraging one another, uh, simply by, uh, simply by a, a observation um, and by example. And so we can honor God, we can honor the leaders, we can honor our brothers and sisters by being prepared for worship. So uh, so I hope that this has helped you kind of think uh, more specifically about pre being prepared for worship. There's some good reasons biblically why we should think about uh, not simply coming uh, as passive observers, not simply coming as consumers, but coming ready uh, to offer a sacrifice of praise, uh, showing God that he's worthy of our time and our effort uh, to participate actively in uh, worship. Worship is a response to God prompted by the Spirit. Worship is something that we give into, not something that we come to take. Uh, and worship uh, preparing helps us orient ourselves, uh, orient our attitudes toward God and toward serving others before ourselves. All right, as we prepare for our time of worship on Sunday, we'll begin, uh, as we do so often, with a psalm. And this week is Psalm 95, which is a familiar one. Um, and it literally does call us to worship. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock. 
of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. So we come to offer our praise. We respond to that calling to worship, and we're going to sing a new song this week. And I will put uh, links to uh, for you to listen to all the songs uh, in the description. Uh, but our new song this week is from Sovereign Grace. And we sing a lot of their music, and uh, it's called All Praise to Him. And it's a kind of a reworking of an older hymn, uh, but it's a wonderful Trinitarian uh, hymn. So the first verse talks about God the Father. The second verse talks about God the Son. And then the third verse talks about uh, God the Holy Spirit, and then kind of summarizes uh, that, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, the last four lines of the song say, To Father, Son, and Spirit now, our souls we lift, our wills we bow. To you, the triune God, we raise with loving hearts our song of praise. Uh, it's just wonderfully written, um, uh, a, a singable melody, and so I think you'll enjoy that. Um, uh, but just a, a, a good a solid song of praise to God uh, to start us out as we think about uh, adoring the Lord and thinking about who God is. We put God first. We think about who he is. We praise him for who he is and what he's done uh, before we think about ourselves. Um, And so that's a great song that will help us do that uh, this week. All praise to him from Sovereign Grace Music. Then we'll continue uh, from there in the book of Hebrews And Hebrews chapter 3 talks specifically about Jesus and why Jesus is worthy. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share the heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. And then later on in the passage, it says, uh, Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. And our, our confidence and our boasting in our hope starts uh, with the gospel itself, the story of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we'll sing uh, a, a wonderful song. Uh, that helps us just tell that story again. Remember what Christ has done for us. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed, the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid. So we think about God's holiness and greatness, and in light of that, we realize and recognize and acknowledge that we are sinful and that the wrath of God should rightly be against us, and yet we look to the cross and see the grace of of God in Christ, uh, that the wrath of God has been on Jesus laid for us. And so we sing about uh, his death and his suffering. uh, And then, of course, at the end, uh, we celebrate the resurrection. See, the stone is rolled away. Behold, the empty tomb. Hallelujah. God be praised. He's risen from the grave. We'll sing that uh, as we remember the gospel. And, And again, just like Hebrew said, our confidence and our boasting in our hope, if we hold fast to that. And so we remember that and and recall that for each other, rehearsing the gospel together uh, so that we can do just that, so we can hold on to the truth of what we believe and the hope that we have because of the resurrection. Uh, Then, of course, we have our sermon and our pastoral prayer. uh, But to respond uh, to our sermon, our song of response to close out the service uh, is going to be grace that is greater than our sin. Uh, And again, remember uh, our sinfulness in light of God's of God's holiness uh, dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? And then we, again, we look to the cross. Look, there's flowing a crimson tide, whiter than snow you may be today. So it's a good reminder as well. Um, uh, worship is primarily for believers, and we need, uh, even as believers, we need this reminder uh, and going back to the basics every single week, remembering just the simple gospel that God is holy, that we are sinners, that Christ has died uh, to make us uh, reconciled to God, uh, and then that our response to that gospel is to believe and repent uh, and to live a life that honors God. Um, but also we acknowledge that um, and, and we hope and, and that there are unbelievers there who can see uh, our remembering of the gospel and our celebration of the gospel, and that they can be convicted uh, by the Spirit to repent again. So the last verse uh, is an invitation. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace freely bestowed on all who believe. You who are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace receive? Because that's what we believe, uh, that as soon as the Spirit quickens the heart, you recognize your sinfulness and uh, believe 
in Jesus Christ, uh, that he died on the cross, that you are a sinner and that he died for your sins. And then you repent of those sins. Uh, this moment, uh, you'll receive his grace, be reconciled with God and your eternity be secured. And so then we'll close out our service after singing uh, with Colossians chapter two. We're reminded, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So the closing word that we're to be abounding in thanksgiving, of course, we'll connect that as we go through this month, as we're thinking about specifically thanksgiving as the holiday comes up. Um, uh, but but more importantly, uh, we received Christ Jesus. We've been reminded in this service of the gospel. We've been reminded of what God has done for us. We've been reminded uh, that we have received Christ Jesus as Lord. And therefore, as we go away from this time of service, as we go into uh, the week and back into our daily lives, we are to walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. We came to be reminded, encouraged and built up in this hour on Sunday uh, in this time of Bible study and preaching and proclamation and singing uh, and reading the Bible together, we're, we're built up in that. We're established in our faith, and then we walk out uh, in order to walk in Him, abounding in thanksgiving, just as you were talking. Have a great week, and we'll see you on Sunday. <laughs>